And friends, good morning. Very warm welcome to our communion service. As we worship the Lord together, may we know his blessing. We continue to welcome uh, Reverend John Johnson with us. It's great to have John with us. And we look forward to his ministry to us today, both through word and sacrament, and later tonight in the fellowship in the hall next door. Uh, the Kirk session uh, this communion season, we're delighted to welcome into membership of the Congregation on Profession of Faith, uh, Kirsty Ann McLean, Dana Murray, Elaine Atkins, and Sheena McLeod. And we trust that the Lord would bless them richly as they join us at the table together for the first time, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Well, good morning, everyone. It really is a privilege to be here. We're almost tempted just to stay put in the back mans for as long as we can because it's been so lovely to be there, but all good things must come to an end. But really, we're delighted to be able to share with you in this communion weekend. And it's just so wonderful, and praise God that you have four new members. It's so thrilling to see God at work here continuing to save people and so be assured of our prayers for you here and all the work you're doing but let's begin our worship to the lord and we're singing from psalm 36 from sing psalms that's page 44 page 44 psalm 36 and it's a psalm thinking of god's character god's attributes that are just so amazing and wonderful that they have to be compared to really big things, to the height of the heavens, to the depths of the ocean, to the mountains, because God is so wonderful that if we're comparing the incomparable to something, we need these huge things. Your steadfast love is great, O Lord. It reaches heaven high. Your faithfulness is wonderful, extending to the sky. So let's stand and we'll sing verses 5 to 10.
Let's pray. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do rejoice at this Lord's Day, a day of remembering the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and conquering the power of sin and death forever. We thank you for this day of rest, for this day of worship, for this day of celebration and communion together, that we can be in the house of God with the people of God, around the table of the Lord. Father, we thank you for these privileges, and we do want to praise you from our hearts that you have been so good to us. Lord, we thank you for this church family here in Back. We thank you for Back Free Church. We thank you for uh, all the men and women and boys and girls who are part of this family. And we ask for your blessing upon this church. Lord, in in particular, we do give thanks for Kirsty Ann and for Dana and Elaine and Sheena and for their profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, this is your doing and you are clearly at work here. And we thank you and we pray that this would continue, that in the coming weeks and months, that we would see your hand of salvation more and more at work, that the arm of salvation of God would be seen in the uh, communities here. Heavenly Father, we just pray that as they come to the table for the first time, that you would assure them of your love and of your peace, and that in the coming days, that they would know your help, We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our helper, that you come alongside us and that you help us in our lives. And we pray that these women would know uh, the Spirit of Christ very much alongside them in the days ahead. Father, we pray for the ongoing preaching and teaching here in this place. Bless Colin and his uh, preaching and all who preach from here May your word go out in power and change lives. May Christians become mature and strong in the faith. May they be zealous for the glory of your name. And may those who are lost be found. Heavenly Father, we are conscious that we are also part of a a huge network of churches around the world. We do pray for the persecuted church today. We thank you for Steadfast Global and their work and for Malcolm McLeod and all that he does. We think of all the projects and the practical help given and for the love of Christ that is shown and for the way in which your people who are so persecuted can know the blessing of knowing people in Scotland, praying for them, helping them and supporting them in practical ways. Father, we thank you that we are part of something enormous that we are part of the kingdom of God, a kingdom which is growing and growing, and we praise you for that. Lord, we do pray for the Sunday school here as well. We thank you for all the Sunday school teachers and all that they do, and for all the boys and girls here in this church. We thank you for those who already trust and follow Jesus, and we pray that our covenant children, that each one of them, in your time and in your way, would come to know and follow the Lord Jesus at a young age. Heavenly Father, we do want to confess our sin again before you. We pause and we we think of the wrong things that we've done even in recent days. And as we were reminded even last night from your word, we thank you that if we confess our sin you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness father we do pray that all that is said and done this morning would be to your glory and that we would leave this place with greater trust in christ greater love in our hearts for christ greater resolve to be his servants 
and greater love for you and for one another. We do pray for those who are unwell at this time, whether physically or mentally, or those who are carrying burdens, whether at work or of the family or of another nature. Lord, we do pray for them that they would know your help. You know our needs and you are sympathetic to us. You love us as a father. And so, Lord, we just pray for those who are in special times of difficulty that they would receive from you special parcels of grace in their time of need. And, Lord, we pray, thanking you for the love in this congregation, one for the other, for the different ways in which people are encouraged and supported and helped. And we pray that this would just grow and grow more and more, that truly... Uh, people who come into Back Free Church would know that folks here are your disciples because they love one another. So Lord, we pray uh, with confidence, we pray with faith, not because we deserve anything, but because you are a generous and benevolent God and we know that you are the God who hears and answers our prayers. And so, Lord, we come expectantly, praying that you would speak to us from your word and that, Lord, our hearts would be enlarged as we consider all that the Lord Jesus has done for us. Hear our prayers, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I've got an ice cream tub here, no ice cream in it, don't worry. But let me see what I have in this tub. It's something very special, so I have to be careful. Oof. Do you know what this is? Have you seen this before? These are Russian dolls. Sometimes I look at these and I think, I don't like Russian dolls because they're so full of themselves. But they really are. And um, if you open up one, there's another one. And if you open up the next one, there's another one. And on it goes. And these are a bit fragile and delicate. So I'm going to be very careful. And actually, these belonged to Sarah's granny. So th this would have come from number three upper call and it was owned by Mary MacDonald here in back and it was passed on to her daughter Mary and then it was passed on to my wife Sarah. So I don't know what she's going to do with it. What do you think Esther? Maybe she'll pass it on to you but we've got three daughters so I better not get into that. But the point is, this is special to us. Sarah's like, why did you bring that in? Because <laughs> don't drop it. It is very special to us. So this was passed on, something special passed on from great grand to grand to mum, and it's going to be passed on again. So let me just put it back before I get into trouble. And boys and girls, I can see quite a few of you here, which is great. Mums and dads can pass on all kinds of things to us. Not just objects like that, like a necklace or a ring or a special ornament or a special doll or toy. But they also pass on many things. They teach us so much. Maybe it was your mum or dad who taught you how to ride your bike or who taught you how to cook. They taught you how to speak, all kinds of things. So much of what we know, of course, we learn some at school, but so much of what we learn is passed on to us by our mums and dads. And so we should be so thankful to them for what they pass on. But all I want to say, boys and girls, is the most important thing that your mums and dads can pass on to you is to tell you about Jesus. 
the most important thing that your parents can pass on to you is to tell you about the love that Jesus has for you and what it means to follow him and trust in him so that you too can go to heaven. And we read something wonderful in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Let me just read you this one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. And it speaks about a granny called Lois. And she passes on something to her daughter who's called Eunice. This is what it says. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So here's a Christian gran, Lois, and she wants to pass on the amazing news that in Jesus we can have eternal life and be forgiven and be part of God's family. And so Lois does that. She um, passes this news, this wonderful message, on to her daughter Eunice. And, what, and Eunice believes. She has faith and she becomes a Christian. And then what happens next? Eunice passes it on to Timothy. And he believes and he becomes a follower of Jesus too. And so it's just a wonderful picture, I think. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, of a granny called Lois passing on something so precious, more precious than our Russian doll back there, passing on the news of Jesus, and Eunice passes it on to Timothy, and I'm sure Timothy passed it on. So know that your parents... Uh, Love it when you come to Sunday school. Love it when you come to church. Love it when you read the Bible at home and worship God at home too. Because they know the best thing they have to pass on to you is the love of God and the message of Jesus. Well, we're going to read now from God's Word. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 52. And we'll read from verse 13, Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, to the end of chapter 53. Let's hear God's word. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed. For our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed 
and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Amen. May God bless that reading from his holy and inspired word. We're now going to sing in Gaelic, Psalm 103, the first two verses of Psalm 103. Is that written on the, on the back of the bulletin that you picked up at the door on the way in? No man in the annex is an ish, the near ye half a moor. Oh, man.
Well, please, let's open our Bibles again and return to that passage, Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 13. We're not going to look at the whole passage, but just the first half of it. Sometimes we can meet someone for the first time and we can form an opinion about that person based on first impressions, how they look, how they dress, what job they do, their accent, all these kinds of things. We meet them, we might size them up. We're told, aren't we, that first impressions can last, make a good first impression And this, of course, can be quite judgmental if we do that, evaluating people on kind of shallow factors. And sometimes we might meet someone and we might form certain opinions about them and we might be completely wrong about that person. We might size them up and get it completely wrong. Back in November 2009, there was a a singer on a TV show called Britain's Got Talent. You all know what that is. And she was judged really harshly before she began to sing. She was 47. She was unemployed. She didn't dress in cool clothes in any way. She wasn't glamorous. She said... She wanted to be as famous as Elaine Page, and everyone laughed at her in the audience. But her name was Susan Boyle, if you remember her. And when she started to sing, I Dreamed a Dream from Les Miserables, the audience were spellbound. And she went on to, be, to sell 10 million records, I think, something like that. And so the people in the audience, when they looked at Susan Boyle at first and just laughed, they got it wrong about Susan Boyle because she was full of singing talent. And we often make the same mistake ourselves. In the novel by Tolkien called The Hobbit, there's a wizard called Gandalf, And he proposes in that story, sorry if I'm spoiling it for you, but surely you've read it. He proposes that a hobbit called Bilbo Baggins becomes the burglar for their expedition. But the dwarves are upset. They ridicule the idea. They look at this creature uh, that's so unusual, who loves its home comforts and seems so mild-mannered and seems pretty useless for a dangerous adventure. And they're like, no way, we're not taking this hobbit on our adventure. But as the story progresses, the the dwarves get it wrong about the hobbit because he is so key in saving them time and time again. And perhaps there are people that you have formed an opinion of quickly. They say that our lives are like icebergs because icebergs... What you can see above the surface is just 10% and then 90% is under the water. And sometimes we look at people and we might judge them uh, and there's so much that we get wrong. And as we meet the servant of the Lord in this passage in Isaiah 52 and 53, as we meet the servant of the Lord who is the Lord Jesus Christ, we find that many of the Jewish people have assessed Jesus and got it completely wrong. They've sized him up, how he looked, the things he said, where he came from. They formed an opinion about Jesus, a negative one, and they've got it completely wrong about Jesus. And that can happen today in your community here in back. 
or throughout the island or throughout our country of Scotland. Many people hear about Jesus and they assess him and they get it wrong about Jesus. They don't see how amazing he is as our saviour, as the Lord, as the king, and how much we need him and how he is worthy of all our worship and praise. He is worthy of our very lives. But thankfully, many people change their minds about Jesus and through the grace of God, discover how wonderful he is. And it's my prayer that many of you here who haven't professed Christ yet will come to see Jesus for who he really is. Again, it's so thrilling that you're using Christianity Explored and that many of you are taking part in that uh, and you've done it loads of times over the years and I just think that's so wonderful. And it's also, as I already said, so thrilling that you have new members today. And all these people, God has opened their eyes before they would have had a wrong understanding of Jesus, but now they have a right understanding of who Jesus is. So I want us to focus on that today, thinking about people in this passage who have a wrong understanding of Jesus, but then how God opens their eyes to have a right understanding of Jesus. But before we do that, I want to think about Jesus' victory. So that's going to be our first heading of three this morning, Jesus' victory. And in chapter 52, verses 13 to 15 act as a summary of the, of the rest of the passage, of the, a summary, if you like, of the following verses. So let's just work through some of these verses now from verse 13, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant will act wisely. And probably a better translation, don't trust me on that, trust the late John L. Mackay, but a better translation is probably, behold, my servant will succeed. So as we think about the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, straight away at the beginning of this fourth uh, servant song, it says, behold, my servant will succeed. And so straight away, the Lord is bringing our attention to the victory of Jesus. Yes, Jesus is going to suffer. This is a prophecy. Yes, he'll suffer. Yes, many people will think he's unimportant. But Jesus shall be victorious. And that means that as Christians this morning, we are part of something that will be ultimately victorious. And we share in the victory that Christ had over sin, over the devil, over death, as he died and rose again. And that is such a wonderful thing. We think back in history to all the different kingdoms of the world, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the British Empire, and they kind of rise and then they fall, don't they? They come and they go. No human empire, whether it's the Polish one or the Russian empire or the German one or whatever, they come and they go. But with the kingdom of God, that comes and grows and never stops and is the only lasting thing that there will be. I love the picture in Daniel where, remember, when the rock strikes the statue and the rock grows and grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth. Do you remember that? That's the kingdom of God. That's what we are part of. If we belong to Jesus, we are part of the only uh, institution, the only thing that will last eternally. And so that should put a spring in our step this morning. Wow, we belong to Jesus we belong to the kingdom of God that will never end. Behold, my servant will be 
successful. So who is this suffering servant of the Lord? Well, we're given a clue in verse 13. Verse 13 says, He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And we think, hang on a minute, haven't we heard that kind of language before in the book of Isaiah? And we have. Famously in Isaiah 6 verse 1, remember in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And so, who is high high and exalted? It's the Lord God who is high and exalted. And then in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, for this is what the high and exalted one says, who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place. And so that's amazing, isn't it, that the one who is high and exalted in Isaiah is clearly the Lord God, it's Yahweh, the creator. And yet, the servant of the Lord here is the one who is high and exalted. And that can only mean one thing, that Jesus is God, that even though he's the suffering servant, he is also the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's a wonderful thing too, isn't it? As we celebrate the Lord's Supper later on, and as we contemplate the one who bled and died for us on the cross, who is that person? He's none other than God himself. That's how much God loves us, that God himself was willing to become a human and give his life for us. There's a hymn called The Servant King, And there's a line in it that says this, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. That's amazing, isn't it? That's an awesome thing to think about. Hands that flung stars into space. Jesus, who is the creator, who made the sun and the moon and the stars, would humble himself so that he would come down to earth and suffer and die for us. So as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, and as we uh, share the bread and the wine, and think about God's love for us, we remember that the one who did this was our King, our Creator. And then we move on to verse 15, and it says, So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. So in this prophecy in Isaiah, who are these kings? And what will they see? And what will they understand? Well, this is all part of the victory of the suffering servant. The victory of the servant of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. The kings are Gentile kings. Kings from all over the world. As well as... Uh, the people in the countries of those kings. The kings represent the people. And so what we're told here, what's being prophesied about in this wonderful passage, is that one day when Jesus comes and dies and rises again, people from all over the world, not just in Israel, but all over the world, will come to see and understand. Now, these are verbs of perception, seeing and understanding. And in the Bible, these words speak of conversion, people coming to faith, people becoming Christians. And so as we read this first part of this passage, verse 14, yes, Jesus will die on the cross. He will be terribly disfigured. He'll be even hard to recognize As a human being, such will be his suffering. He'll be shattered. It will look like defeat as he bleeds and dies on the cross. But then, when he rises again, people from all over the world will come to understand the true significance of his suffering. That No, this is not defeat, but this was the servant's work 
And through his death, he will bring life. His death will defeat the power of death once and for all and will bring eternal life to all those who trust in Jesus. So that's the prophecy that kings and their subjects will come to trust in Jesus. And has it happened? Of course it's happened. Because now we are part of a worldwide church family. There are Christians all over the world. And so we can trust in the Bible. We can trust in God's word. Everything the Lord says will come to pass, comes to pass. And 2,000, well, more than 2,000 years, 2,800 years since this prophecy, 2,700 years or or thereabouts, we can see uh, people all over the world who have trusted in the Lord Jesus. And so that's the victory. That's our first heading. And it's so encouraging, the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because sometimes it's hard being a Christian. Sometimes we can get disillusioned and even want to give up. Or we can have doubts. Or we just don't see as many people converted as we would like to see. And we can become discouraged. So I hope this will encourage us that actually we are part of the body of Jesus. We are part of the kingdom of God. And in Jesus, there's already victory. We are on the winning side. Like Colin, I'm a a Rangers fan and I haven't tasted much victory there over the last 10 years. Uh, And it's kind of annoying when you're not on the winning side. But as Christians, you know, we are on the winning side. So if you're feeling discouraged as a Christian today, maybe remember that. You are on the winning side. You have a future in heaven, in the new heavens, in the new earth, where you will live forever and ever with a new body, perfected in body and soul. And it's all because of the suffering of the servant here. So that's the victory. Secondly, I want us to see a wrong assessment of Jesus. And then our third heading will be a right assessment of Jesus. So first of all then, our second heading is a wrong assessment of Jesus. So we're moving into chapter 53 now. So let's look at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 53. So Israel looks at Jesus and what does she see? When Israel assesses Jesus, sizes Jesus up, what does she see? What do people think about the servant? Well, they look at Jesus and they think Jesus is nothing special at all. Verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him in other words they looked at Jesus and he didn't look anything special he just looked ordinary and unimpressive an ordinary man verse John 6 verse 41 so the Jews grumbled about him because he said I am the bread that came down from heaven they said Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? So they just look at Jesus, they assess him, and they make a wrong assessment. They just think he's a nothing. He's unimportant. Verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. What does that mean? Well, Jesus, where does he come from? He comes from Nazareth. It's an obscure place, a nowhere place. Remember those words, can any good thing come from Nazareth? I'm from Cumbernauld, so I know how that feels. Where are you from, Cumbernauld? All right. Uh, And uh, that's a kind of tumbleweed moment sometimes for people. Can anything good come from there? I don't know. But that's, that's what's going on here about Jesus. Nazareth? Most of the 
holier religious people lived down in Jerusalem at the temple and Nazareth, you know, that was a place full of foreigners and incomers and where the worship of God wasn't very strong. Who would want to live in a place like that? And so people looked at Jesus and they're like, you're from Nazareth. You're not an important person. And so they ignored Jesus. They're basically saying he doesn't matter. No big deal. But it gets worse than that. Because not only are people ignoring Jesus, they're actually despising Jesus. Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. And at the end of verse 4. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So when people looked at Jesus, disfigured, bloodied, battered, bruised body on the cross, they made a wrong assessment, a wrong evaluation. They looked at Jesus dying on the cross and they thought, he must have done something really bad for this to happen to him. Surely he must have rebelled against the might of Rome and insulted Rome. He's getting what he deserved, or he's a blasphemer. He must have done something wrong. It's a bit like in Job, in Job 22. Job's three friends look at Job's suffering and, and, and say, in verse 5, you must have done something wrong for all this suffering to be happening to you, Job. And they're wrong about that. And the people are wrong about Jesus. They, they are making a wrong assessment about him. Because we know, don't we, that Jesus is not suffering because of his sin. But he's under the judgment of God for our sin. But they look at him and they think he's under the ju judgment of God because of his own sin. They look at Jesus and they get it totally wrong. And so that's our second heading, a wrong assessment. But our last heading this morning is a right assessment of Jesus. A right assessment of Jesus. Because some of the people don't remain in a state of spiritual blindness. Because God opens their eyes. And so now they have a right assessment of themselves and their own hearts and a right assessment of Jesus as well. They can now see spiritually much more clearly. And so now they understand the reason for Jesus' suffering. Verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. So yes, Jesus is cursed by God, but not because of his sin, but because of our sin. And that's what we remember in the supper, isn't it? When we take the bread and we take the wine, he loved me so much that he did that for me as our substitute who carried in love our guilt and our shame. And so they understand that. God has opened their eyes. And they come to understand their own condition rightly too, that they are sinners who deserve the punishment of God. Verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Pierced. That means here that Jesus is given a deadly wound. He was crushed. That means he was ground down like powder. And he experienced all these things. Why? We're told for our transgression. What does transgression mean? It means rebelling against the king. So as human beings, all of us here, me included, all of us, we have rebelled against God's rules. God is our king. And transgression means to rebel against his good and loving rules. We know sometimes what's 
what's wrong, and we do it anyway. We're rebels. We're transgressors. And then it speaks of our iniquities. And that word iniquity means twistedness, that there's something warped and radically wrong with all human beings because sin permeates every part of our lives. There's a kind of rottenness about us all. And it's obvious, really, isn't it? Because if any of us said, right, I'm going to do my best today not to do anything wrong, how long will it last for? Not very long. We know that we are sinners. This is God's assessment of you and God's assessment of me, that we are desperately in need of forgiveness because of our own rebellious hearts. Do you believe that? Do you accept God's assessment of you? Or are we too busy assessing God? Shouldn't be like that. We're just creatures. How can we assess God? It should be the other way around. God assesses us. He's the creator. He's the boss. He's in charge. And he says, we are transgressors, full of iniquity. We're constantly saying and doing things we ought not to do. You've been doing Christianity Explored again. And one of the most striking illustrations in that course is when it says, imagine all your evil thoughts were up on a screen displayed for everyone to see. Do you remember that part? What would you do? And I think all of us would agree. We wouldn't ever want to come back to Back Free Church if other people could see all the wrong things throughout all our lives, even in our thought lives, or jealousy, or greed, or pride, anger when we shouldn't have been angry. Imagine people could see what was really going on in our hearts. We would be so ashamed. We're full of iniquity and transgression. But the good news is that Jesus has died so that we can be forgiven of all of that. And it's all wiped away. And so we can have peace. Verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. So as we think of that screen that we would be so ashamed of, as Christians, we don't have to worry about that anymore because it's all been dealt with. There is no recording for us to watch. Because Jesus paid for all our sin as he died for us. And so God is in this crucial Old Testament passage is explaining the suffering of the servant to us. He's explaining why Jesus had to die on the cross. And if it wasn't for your sin and my sin, Jesus wouldn't have had to have died on the cross. But we are sinners. And so in his love, he laid down his life for us. It's because of my pride and my greed and my folly and my laziness that Jesus had to die on the cross. Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And so if you're not a Christian here yet, let me urge you as a wandering sheep to come to Jesus because there is no one else who can forgive you. There is no one else who can give you a new heart, but he can. So come to him. Don't delay. Don't wait. Don't wait and think, oh, I'll do that when I'm older. You probably won't if you're thinking that now. You don't know if you'll even have tomorrow. I was reading the other day just the the words of Peter in, in John 6. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Come to Christ. He is the only Savior. You can't save yourself. 
I can't save you. None of the elders here could save you. Only Jesus can. So come to him. And then we read, in the Lord, verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ died in our place. He died instead of us. He died not for his own sins. He wasn't getting what he deserved. But he was getting what we deserved. And so this is the marvelous truth of the gospel. This is the great swap, the great exchange that our sins are put on Jesus and his righteousness, his goodness is put on us. This is the gospel. And it was no accident. It was all God's plan. It was all God's will. Verse 6, the second half, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And let's close this part with this thought. Remember that Old Testament picture from Leviticus 16 of the high priest laying his hands on the scapegoat, confessing the sin of the people on that goat. The goat's then sent out into the wilderness to die. And so what's being pictured there is that it's the goat who dies instead of the Israelites who deserve to die. And that's, of course, just a picture, a signpost pointing forward to the real Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so it's as if God the Father is placing his hands on his son Jesus and sending him off to die for us. It cost Jesus so much to save us. It cost him his own life. He experienced not just the physical suffering at the cross, but the anger of of his father, the white-hot anger of his father as he was treated as sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So let's pause. What's your assessment of Jesus? Do you have a wrong assessment of Jesus? I don't need Jesus. I'm perfectly fine without Jesus. I hope that's not the case for you. I hope that you can say, he's my savior. He's the Lord. He's God. And he died on the cross for me. And I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to follow him. Have you trusted Jesus yourself? Let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this part of your word. We thank you for how clearly you have told us that Jesus did not die for his own sin but for the sins of his people. And Father, we thank you that we all have the opportunity to confess our sins to you in prayer, to put our trust not in ourselves, but in Jesus, so that we too can know the peace of God, the peace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, The peace knowing that our sins have been taken away and our futures are secure in your loving hands and that no one can snatch us from your hand. Lord, we do pray that everyone here in this room might put their trust in Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that we will never regret surrendering our lives to you for there is no one like you no one loves us as much as you love us and your love for us is always and forever
Continue to bless us, Lord, even as we uh, eat the bread and drink the wine in a short time. May we be assured of your love, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing now from Psalm 51. You'll find that on page 280, page 280. Psalm 51 from the Scottish Psalter from the beginning. And we'll sing verses 1 to 7, the first six stanzas. After thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me, for thy compassion's great. Blot out all mine iniquity. <clears throat> Never tire of singing that, wash thou me, and then I shall be whiter than the snow. Well, as we just begin to think about the Lord's Supper, just three simple things just now, that before the supper it's good for us to look back 
It's good for us to look around and it's good for us to look up. At the supper, it's good to look back. And that's what we've been doing in this sermon. So I don't want to speak about that very much. We look back at the cross. We look back and remember the substitution of Jesus. If anyone does anything for us, surely we need to be thankful. Someone gives their time. Someone is thoughtful and sends us a card or even a text or something. And we're thankful that they should do something for us. But this is a, a supper of thanksgiving as we look back and remember Jesus giving his life for us, enduring the penalty of our sin. And so we look back, and we've done that this morning. We've looked back at the cross and thought about what Jesus has done and achieved the victory that he's achieved for us through his dying and rising again. But we should also look around. And I don't think we talk about that as much as we do when we have the Lord's Supper. And I would encourage you to look around during the Lord's Supper because I think sometimes it can be too private. But it's the opposite of private, isn't it? It's something we share in. It's something we do together. We pass around the bread and wine. We meet together in church to share because we are part of the body of Christ. That you are people of different ages and backgrounds and talents. And yet, what do you have in common? You're sinners saved by the grace of God. And so I would encourage you not to privatize communion, if you like, as something just for you, but to also look around and say, Jesus died for her. Jesus died for him. We are part of the same family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a beautiful part of communion, to look around. And maybe there are some people here who have offended you or upset you. And uh, maybe you haven't forgiven them. And it's kind of hard not to forgive if you think, actually, they're, they're my family and Jesus loves them, and so I need to love them too, and I do. So don't just look at yourself, but look around at all the people God has been at work in. And we also need to look up, because Jesus is now in heaven, where he reigns in the control room of heaven. He's sovereign. He's in charge of all things. And remember that too as you take the supper. Look up and remember that Christ, and we're told he now lives, to intercede for us. So we worship a risen Savior who lives to intercede for us, who prays for us, who protects us, who's involved in our lives, who's with us now. By his spirit. I remember Charlie Anderson. Sorry, Bill Anderson, I should say. Bill Anderson, who used to work at the um, offices. And he went to Beclou Free Church. And once he said to me, do you know I pray for you every day? And that just blew me away. It really humbled me. I was so thankful. And I just thought, wow, I don't deserve that. But I'm so glad. I'm so thankful. And so I thanked him uh, for that. I didn't even know him that well. And it means so much to us, doesn't it, when we know that other Christians are praying for us, particularly in times of difficulty. But the Bible says something even more wonderful that Jesus is praying for us, that he lives to intercede for us, that Jesus is praying for you. So we need to look up and remember that our risen Savior 
Jesus loves us and he lives to intercede for us. Well, we read the warrant for having the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's sing now from Psalm 118 from the Scottish Psalter. That's page 398, page 398. And from verse 15. In dwellings of the righteous is heard the melody of joy and health. The Lord's right hand doth ever valiantly. the table don't we and remind ourselves of who should take part in the Lord's Supper and really it's for people as we saw in the sermon together from Isaiah 52 and 53 it's for those who look at Christ and understand that he died for us it's those it's for those who look at themselves and realize yes I'm not a good person. I've made a mess morally in my life. I've broken God's rules so many times, and I don't deserve anything from God.
but it's for people who lay hold of Jesus, who receive him as their savior, who love him and follow him. It's not for perfect people. We're all broken sinners in so many ways, but it's just for those who look at Christ and know that he bled and died for them. So if that describes you, and if you are a member in good standing, either in this church or another church of Christ, then it is not back free church's table or even the free church's table, but it's the table of the Lord. And so we would encourage you uh, to take part. Let's pray. Father, we do just thank you so much for these simple elements of bread and wine that we have set them aside today for a holy purpose and a joyful purpose that we can give thanks as we look back and remember what you have done for us, as we look around at our brothers and sisters in the church family, and as we look up and see you, the victor in heaven, reigning and ruling and working all things for our good. Father, please, may you bless the bread and wine to us. May we eat and drink assured of your unflinching, unfaltering love for your covenant people. And may you give us humble hearts. For Lord, we know we don't deserve these things. May you give us thankful hearts. May you give us a sense of just overwhelming peace that we, as we were singing in the psalm earlier this morning, that we can shelter under the shadow of your wings, that we can know the confidence of the love that you have for us, which will never let us go. So Lord, bless the supper to us. Bless those in particular taking part for the first time. And Lord, bless those watching on that it wouldn't be too long before they too could come and put their trust in King Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Well, we've been thinking about looking back, looking around, and looking up. But lastly, the Word Supper encourages us to look forward as well, doesn't it? And it's so clear in 1 Corinthians 11, because it says in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So there's that sense of anticipation each time we have the Lord's Supper. We're looking forward to the day when the victorious Lord Jesus comes back again, the second coming. And I hope we can all do that now. Just think about that glorious thought because we know what it's like living in a fallen world. We get fed up of ourselves, don't we? Our own sin, like Paul, when he said, the good things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And even the earth, we're told in Romans 8, groans, looking forward to the, re the renewal of all things at the end. So we are to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's just enjoy that wonderful thought for a moment that one day Jesus will come back, sweep away everything that's wrong with the world and remake the world so that there will be a new heavens and a new earth and the righteousness will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. So the goodness and love of God doesn't just deal with our past, our sins, or even our present as Christ is with us by his spirit and lives to intercede for us, but it also gives us a great future, doesn't it? And so we have so much to be thankful for and to look forward to. Let's conclude our service singing to God's praise from Psalm 130 from Sing Sam, so that's page 173, page 173, and we'll sing the whole of Psalm 130. Lord, from the depths, I call to you. Lord, hear me from on high and give attention to my voice when I for mercy cry. And all the way down to the last verse, O Israel, put your hope in God, for mercy is with him and full redemption from their sins, his people he'll redeem. <clears throat> Lord, from the
Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.